Hallelujah. Please be seated. God bless you. Thank you for coming to church. God bless you, bless you, bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, next weekend, starting from Friday, we will begin the celebrations of our fifth anniversary. <laughs> Hallelujah. You are not excited, though. <laughs> I can't hear you, too. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So on Friday, as we all know, we'll be online. We'll have a, an evening of testimonies. This morning, they forwarded the testimonies to me that have come in already. And they range from all kinds of things. You know, and I was just looking at them and I'm like, oh my God, only you could have done this. So on Friday, starting at 7 p.m. through to 9 p.m., would be online. That's both on Facebook and YouTube. And we'll be, um, we'll celebrate an evening of testimonies. Hallelujah. On Saturday, um, starting at 9 a.m., we would have an extended aroma. That is from 9 to 12. How, is there, how many hours is that? Nine to twelve, Mary. No, ah, okay, Ray. We're going to five. We'll have five hours of worship. Hallelujah. So, and then after that, we will break bread and we'll go. And then on Sunday, we will migrate somewhere, <laughs> and we'll have massive. We'll have a really good service, and then we'll have lunch. Is worth all of that and then some. <laughs> Father Lord, we just want to say thank you. But between, before then, let's go back to, come back to earth. And let's go <laughs> to our series on the will of God. Hallelujah. We started the will of God 10 weeks. Is the, this is the 10th installment we've been on this um, series. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last week, who remembers what we looked at? The, um, eh? Eh? the crisis of belief, yes. And today we want to take a look at another aspect of our lives. Last week we said that the will of God is messy. Because you can't judge the will of God only by outcome. Hallelujah. And so you think that you have walked in the will of God and yet the outcome is not what you would have wanted. So what do you do at that point? Do you say you are no longer in the will of God or are you still in the will of God? But today we want to move into something. This is one of the, there, there are a few things in Christendom that cause trouble. And this is one of them. The will of God concerning marriage. So today our topic is chasing 10,000. Because the Bible says one shall chase a thousand and two shall chase 10,000. Hallelujah. So we are looking at chasing 10,000. That is our topic from today, for today. But the, the, it's really the will of God part 10. And we want to examine what the Bible says or what we imagine that the will of God will be concerning marriage. Hallelujah. Now there are many, many, many things that are concerning marriage that I don't even have the time or the energy to begin to knock out of the park today. So my job today is not to tell you this is not right and that is right. My job today is to provide you a framework, whether you are in marriage or outside of marriage, to recognize what the will of God looks like when it comes to marriage. Hallelujah. Amen. So we want to look at what is god's will for marriage but if you remember as early as the second installment of the um of the will of god we looked at what i called bags remember we said that there are four universal wills of god and they are to what believe abstain sub um give thanks and submit and it formed the acronym bags for us believe abstain Give thanks and submit. Those are the four universal wills. If you check your Bible, there are only those four things that the Bible will say this expressly. The Bible will say this is the will of God concerning you. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Aside from that, I also told us that God trusts us enough to give us up to 80% or more room for us to make the decisions that, you know, that, 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 uh, that we run our lives with. Yes? Now, it's very weird, but marriage is one of that 80%. God trusts you enough to choose your spouse. <laughs> So all of you that are planning to leave your marriage because you said you married the wrong person, you are lying. You married the right person. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because nobody chose for you. You chose for yourself. Are you telling me that you're, you don't, you are not, you're not smart enough to make the right decisions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But like I said, I'm not here to, I don't want to quarrel today. So I just want to say what I know and then I will leave. First, First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse number 3. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse number 3. This is one of the bags, you know, one of the universal wheels of God as we saw when we looked at that um, that's um, that installment for first Thessalonians chapter 4 verse number 3 it says for this is the will of God your sanctification I'm reading the ESV translation for this is the will of God your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality hallelujah so how can I begin a marriage conversation from abstinence I start a marriage conversation from abstinence because what that means, therefore, is that if God says the will of God for us is to abstain from sexual immorality, it automatically means that there are parameters of the, yes, there are parameters or a template within which we can enjoy sex because sex is created by God, yes? So, and that parameter is what? Marriage. I don't want to ask, answer your question. Now you sabi do what you want to do. You, Shabi, I told you, God trusts you to make your decisions. It no concern me. So don't come to me and say, but, you know, in, we are civilized now. I don't want to hear. Don't come to me. I don't, it's not a conversation. I don't have the energy today. What I just know is that the Bible says one of the will, universal wills of God for you is abstain from sexual immorality. Which means that if man must have sex, there has to be something that God is provided within, what, within which man must have sex or will have sex. And that is what? So therefore, if you are having sex outside of marriage, what are you? You are a sinner. But it's not today. That we will have that conversation. Let me just, because I can see that some people are sw is sweating inside this AC that Sashola is covering herself. So let's move on quickly. I didn't come to judge. Honestly, I didn't come to judge. But if we don't put that there, that's the pillar upon which everything else grows. If we don't put that out there, then we would make mistakes as we're going on. Okay? So, but all, mar all marriage is not about sex. You know that, right? So it's not like, oh, sex is the only thing that happens in marriage. So if, you know, then, no, there are so many other things that happen in marriage that are not sexual. Yes? Yes? yes. Okay, if you never married, you feel, no, no, don't worry. But the men in this will tell you that they spend money inside marriage. Abby? Guys, you pay school fees inside marriage, Abby? Eh? <laughs> because inside marriage you can't deny it's not baby daddy your conversation you are the father when it is time to pay school fees the child stands in front of you but again inside of marriage is not only school fees we pay hallelujah but this is not a marriage seminar maybe one day we will do a marriage seminar hallelujah I just want to tell you what God thinks this is a universal thought in God's mind about marriage Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 27. Genesis chapter 1 26 to 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him them. Male and female, he created them. First plan of marriage is that man would replicate or represent or reproduce or project the image of God. That's why when you look at Genesis chapter 1, you know, well, in this house, we know Genesis chapter 1. We can say it backwards. So that's not a problem. But I have never brought it to you to, to look at it from the filter of marriage. When it says in verse 27, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created man, male and female, so that verse 26 can happen. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. When God looks in the earth, the people who look the most like God are the married people. They don't vex. <laughs> Marriage gives us the opportunity to be like God in many instances. One of the instances being that God is a three in one God. He's a God in three parts, but he's one God, yes? And the Bible says in marriage that the two shall come together and they shall become one. By marriage, we project, we, we are able to project that, um, um, the harmony that comes out of different parts in one. Do you understand that? So the main idea for marriage before God is so that we can reflect his image in plurality and in unity. In plurality, which means that we are more than one in the marriage, but the Bible, the matter of the Bible when it comes to marriage is two shall become one, yes? So two people from two different backgrounds come together and the Lord sees them as a unit, yes? So out of plurality, unity is born, yes? So the reason why marriage <clears throat> does exist, apart from all the other many things, is that we must reflect the image of God. What did I say? Another reason why marriage is intended or why God put marriage in place is for fruitfulness. Genesis 1.28 he said to them, he said, um, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish. And it goes on and on. Yes, we don't encourage this anymore because it's the reason why some people have 32 children. We, we, we are trying to discourage you to say that's not the only reason. That fruitfulness does not mean you should have one child on top of another one and on top of another one. The people who have four are looking at me and I me did i send you just leave me alone <laughs> praise jesus let's go on <laughs> but fruitfulness is one of the fruits of marriage hallelujah fruitfulness god wants to fill the earth remember what he said to abraham out of genesis chapter 6 uh, 12 he says in your seed shall the nations of the earth be blessed and the first step for the nations of the earth to be blessed by the seed of abraham is that abraham had to first pro procreate yes so yes marriage is for procreation that's another reason praise god god knows that let me go on. <laughs> I said it's not a marriage conference, so I'm not teaching about marriage, really. I'm teaching the will of God. Don't forget. Another reason why marriage exists, <laughs> another reason why marriage exists is to establish the kingdom of God. It's to establish the kingdom of God. Because when you look at that Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, when it says have dominion, subdue, replenish, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, replenish it and have dominion. What he's saying is that you must establish the kingdom of God. I say it this way, establish the government of God where you are at. Hallelujah. A man and a woman are more, most powerful at the point when their, their spirit fuse together. Do you understand that? So the word of the work of domin dominion is a work that is best done when that happens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Marriage 
is for companionship. This is kindergarten stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. the, because I'm sure people were waiting for me to come and say one head shattering thing, nothing. Marriage is for companionship. Where to, you know, um, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. When you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 12, it tells you that two are better than one. Because when one is cold, the other will lie beside them and give them heat. And when one is, um, falls down, the other one will help him get up. So any which way, marriage is where you find that proximity and intimacy between people to be able to get that done. Do you understand it? So this is the reason why, some of the reasons why marriage exists. Praise God. Now the problem is that because we carry this will of God and we've made it one Sharuba on something, a lot of us think that when it comes to marriage, there is a special will of God concerning marriage. And my conversation is that there is no special anything. When it comes to marriage, when it comes to marriage, marriage must fulfill certain universal needs for it to make sense. And so the reason why marriages are breaking is because the need that the individuals have, even when they become fused together and before, become one, those needs are not met. Praise Jesus. So marriage must fulfill something called the law of priority. If you look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, the law of priority. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In the King James translation, it says, and cleave unto his wife. He shall leave his father and his mother. Automatically, that means that the man came to a junction. The man came to a T-junction or a crossroad, and he had to make a choice. Of all the people that are around me, who is priority now? And so the man should choose his wife as priority. Now, whether you like it or not, or whether you know about it or not, or whether you've considered it or not, every human being on earth wants to be someone else's priority. It's a universal need. Everybody wants to say, before I died, one person chose me. Do you understand this conversation? And that's why it is something that is good. So therefore, what that means is that if the one that chose me is the one that I choose, I'm in the will of God concerning marriage. <laughs> I know you want something, and don't worry, maybe we'll get to something. But the point I'm trying to make is that thing that people... <clears throat> say that they are waiting for that one person that they will marry. I've always told you, I say, so you marry the person and you are going home. Let's say God forbid first. God forbid. God forbid. The accident happened and the person died. You are done. You can't marry again. Abby? Eh? Then he said, ha! How accident we just happen just now? We just marry. <laughs> The point is that it's not the one person. It's a kind or a type of person. It's not the one person. So if it's not Ojo, you are done. Or if it's not Benga, your life is finished. No, there are... There are... Um, there are there, traits, types... So the idea is that God wants you to marry a certain kind of person. And that does not include tall, dark, or handsome, and handsome or short, akuns and something. That does not part of it. Whether they have long hair or they have long knees, it's not part of the, <laughs> the criteria. Praise Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody wants to be chosen 
Every single person. Who doesn't want to be chosen for something here? Let's even say it's not marriage. It makes you feel special when they choose you, right? There are 15, of peop peop 15 people in the room and they pick you. It makes you feel like, oh, someone saw me. Isn't that it? Marriage should be that someone saw you. The law of priority suggests that every marriage that will succeed, again, is not a marriage seminar, so don't hold me to anything. The <laughs> every marriage that will succeed will succeed not because you chose the person the first time but because every single day till the end of your life you continue to choose the person do you get it if you do that god knows you are smart he trusts you so that's his will yeah yeah i know somebody is go and look at your scriptures properly and if you can find a place where you come you can come back and say to me and god said you must choose the person that came from the back of that street i don't have a lot of money i'll give you all my money if you can find it the closest thing is genesis 24 that abraham said to his servant eleazar go and get a wife for isaac my son but he said to him, he, gave the, he, gave, he said to him, just make sure that it's from these people. A type of person. It, then the, 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 um, the servant was the one that prayed. The one that was uh, offer me water and offer my animals water. Let that one be the one. Any of, Je of uh, Laban's daughter could have, or, or Jethro's daughter could have been that person. Any one of them that had manners is Isaac's wife. It's finished. So it's a type of person. It's a type of person. It's not a particular one person. Otherwise, ha, what I do? Okay, so um, condition number two, universal condition number two that every marriage must fulfill is called the law of pursuit. The law of pursuit. Someone must pursue you. When the Bible said in Genesis chapter 2, and leave his father and mother, he chose. When it says, and cleave, he pursued. Do you understand it? So to cleave is proactive and intentional. It's not something that happens just, it's, it's not by chance. To cleave means that you've made up your mind that no matter who else wears skirts and parts here, I have chosen this one and I'm done. I've pursued her. I've pu Hopefully my, my girls are not pursuing the men. Because we will do deliverance for you. <laughs> Guess who will do the deliverance? It's not Sashola. It's, it's Uncle Wale that will let me lay hands on them. I say, like, receive sense in Jesus' name. <laughs> But the law of pursuit suggests that the man sees the woman of all the many other women and decides that this is the one. As long as he pursues enough and that one says yes. Guys, there are other things though, but if the one says yes, it's the will of God. See, I think that the devil complicated this matter because he doesn't want us to get it. And I'm just saying to us, it's not as complicated as we make it. Yes, David, I'm, I'm serious. It's not as complicated. If you marry tomorrow, Seth, it's not as complicated. Universal condition number three, possession. Each part of the marriage must feel like, that is each part of each person in a marriage must feel like they own the other person. Possession is the universal law of marriage number three. Not just their body, but all that is them. That's why Mac, is it here? That's why Mac Modi's money is my money. So everything the man owns, it belongs to me. That's universal. Don't ask me whether he can start there and boast the same. Well, we, we <laughs> but the, that's he's supposed to be able to. Well, whether I feel boast them, I don't know. But he's supposed to boast them. Me, I feel boast them. Everything you own belongs to me. But really, that's temp condition number three. So when someone decides to take all that he is and submit it, to the other person, 
to use, to expend, to whatever. It's the law of possession. And when that is fulfilled in a marriage situation, that marriage is within the will of God. Can you see it? How, how many people will drink water when they get home today? Maybe except for the ones who have married. They'll be like, ah, if I know, I for quick. But let's go on. Universal condition number four is what we saw in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Purity. But if you look at it from the book of Genesis chapter 2, because Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, 24 and 25 is the pivotal scripture, first scripture about marriage. Before anything else that Paul said. Now, during the first service, you heard the pastor was reading and he said, Paul will say, I said it's not God said. But this is the base, is the foundation. If you look at verse 25 of Genesis 22, he said they were both uh, naked, the man and the woman, and they were not ashamed. Purity is condition number four. Once there is purity in the room, nobody is ashamed. Purity, the moment purity leaves, that means that sin has entered. The moment when sin comes is when people become ashamed. The way God ordained for marriage to operate, we're not supposed to be ashamed. When a man is ashamed to share with his wife what he's going through, who else is he going to share with? Baba in the village. And when a woman is afraid to share what she's going through with her husband, then who, is the, who else is closest enough, is close enough to be seen as you? I need you to understand this thing. Let me just fast forward and share a testimony with you. I read this testimony many years ago, and it can never leave me. It was the account of a woman whose husband was diagnosed with cancer. He actually was suffering from cancer, and after many, many uh, months of treatment, one day she came to the hospital to see her husband, and they actually told her that he has like maybe three weeks or so to live. She was the one that wrote this testimony and she was so angry. She said, she said three weeks, they said yes. So she said, let her go and check her Bible again. She went and she said she read her Bible and she said that the two of them become one flesh. So she came back and she said, if we are one, how come he has cancer and I don't have cancer? So it's either the Bible is lying or the devil is trying to be funny. I choose that the devil is trying to be funny. So what did she do? She locked everybody out. She copied the scripture. And she placed it. Posted it all around the room. And she sat there and she started to tell God. She said, he is my husband. The two of us have become one. I do not have cancer. So he cannot die of cancer. And when the doctors will come and to check her husband and they will see her like that, they would snigger. And then they would ask her to excuse them. It didn't matter to her. She knew by the time she was telling this testimony when I read it, it was nine years later. And that man that they said they were going to, was going to die in three weeks recovered. That is how powerful this is. The covenant of marriage is so powerful that if God restricted it the way we think it is restricted, it would be useless. The, the things that God achieves when there is synergy in a marriage, why do you think the devil is always on his head wanting to scatter marriage? Because there is so much power between those two people than a country can pack in sometimes. Do you understand that? So when I teach you about the will of God concerning marriage, I'm helping you see that because God knows this thing is useful, he will not narrow it so badly that you can't make choices. What you like, the, the Bible not say he gives you the desires of your heart. So if you like a yellow babe, why would God conscript you to marry a dark one? Think about it. Is that God's character? I know it doesn't sound spiritual, but I'm, 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 I'm telling you something that if you would take it, perhaps some marriage, some marriage and relationships as part will go out of jobs, but it will be a good thing. Yes. 
So the law of priority, everybody wants to be chosen. The law of pursuit, everyone wants to be pursued. The law of possession, everyone wants to belong somewhere where they feel safe. The law of purity, everyone needs at least one person where they can be okay with, no matter what is happening around them. Do you get it? So if you are looking for pillars to descend the will of God, use that. Use that. Is there only one person? No. I can't say it more than that. There is a type of one. Nowhere in the Bible is it said that there is only one person to marry. There is a type of person that you can marry. What is this type of person? Of course, the Bible is very um, 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 particular about belief. Okay? When it talks about people who believe the same thing. But please pay attention to me. But when the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together. If you marry someone of the same faith. But you take your major business, maybe you invest your two billion naira in, 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 in a business with someone who does not believe what you believe. You will lose that money, you can lose that money. So the point is, when the Bible says do not be unequally yoked together, it is not exclusive to marriage. It is about anything that the outcome you don't have control over. So it makes sense that you believe the same things. It makes sense that you value the same things. It makes sense that when there's a quarrel, you can report them to their father who is God. If you marry someone who does, who their father is inside one calabash somewhere, when trouble comes, you have to trek to the bush to look for the calabash and tell the thing inside the calabash that their children is misbehaving. So belief, do you understand? The same belief is something that is important. It is not important because we are discriminating. It is important because it gains you rest and peace in the equation. Do you understand it? It's the same way you want to enter a business agreement with someone and you check them out. Is that not how it used to be done? You check them out. You ask questions. You throw things out to see whether they are crazy about money enough to cut corners and do fraudulent things because if that happens in a business and you guys are found out, you all, when they are calling everybody, they will call you too. So if you are careful when you are doing business, why will you not be careful when you are marrying? Does this make sense? Because when we hold this thing, oh, do not be unequally yoked together. It begins to sound like we hate people. We don't hate people. It's just that honestly, the law of commonality is something. Do you understand it? So do we believe the same thing? Or do you want to be married to a stranger? You are talking left, they are talking right. So it just for ease of when you sleep, you can wake up. You are not afraid someone will press your neck. Because if people believe the same thing. When there's money in the house, you can be sure. You can sit a table and determine how your money will be spent and no one is saying where's Baba's share just because you believe the same thing and you value the same thing and when we begin to talk about those things it's beyond whether you go to the same church because you can go to the same church and God is not their father let me leave it there because it's not a marriage conference hallelujah <laughs> so belief is important Values are important. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 16, it talks about that scripture that I had quoted, being un not unequally yoked together. Then if you look at Proverbs 14, verse 7, it talks about the kinds of people you should have nothing to do with. In Proverbs 14, 7, he says, a foolish person. That you should have nothing to do with a foolish person. What that means, therefore, is you can't marry a foolish person. The problem will be for you and me, what does a foolish person look like? Go to your Bible and say, what does a foolish person do? A foolish person lies. A foolish person doesn't listen to instruction. Once you begin to find those people, you are unequally yoked already. It doesn't matter that they are the pastor of your church, Musobe. I said it. 
If they are your pastor and every time they say good morning, you have to check your watch and you are a stickler for truth, you are already unequally yoked. That thing will cause trouble. God will deliver us from religion. Amen. Of course, the template is that the type of person you should marry should love you. Or do you want to marry somebody who hates you? Eh? And Jacka, should we try the person who hates us? Okay. What about respect? Are these things important to you? Eh? Are they important to you? What about trust? Do you want to marry someone who you trust? What about faith? Don't you want someone you can move mountains together? That's why I titled this Chasing 10,000. The Bible says one shall put 1,000 to flight and two shall put how many? 10,000 to flight. The, 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 the critical um, 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 grace, the, the expansion and the multiplication that happens when grace collides is what this is about. Do you understand it? Every marriage should reflect God. I talked to you about that before. I'm giving you a framework for marriage. This is the will of God do. Because you won't find anything else. Every marriage must be purposeful. When I was going to get married, it was extremely important to me that the person that I married somehow would be okay with whatever God throws me in the future. Before I got married, actually, I already had a conversation with God. I, for starters, I didn't want to marry. So God said, you get to marry. I said, why? He said, because I want to use it. I said, I know people that they are using, they are not married. You don't need, say you, you know, if you hold body, I can't do that with you. You have to marry if I will use you. So I said, okay. Then we started to have the conversation. And part of it is that the person who tomorrow will say to me, throw away your Bible, I, don't, I can't do it again. I can't marry me. So it was God's responsibility to help me sort through all of the mess around me to, be, be, to find someone who is okay with wherever God will send me in the future. Do you understand that? So they must have some level of faith and they must understand that you are on earth for a purpose. Now here's something that is extremely important that they don't even teach you in marriage class. They don't teach you in marriage class that every, just as every individual has a unique purpose, every marriage has a purpose. That's the point of Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Male and female, he made them. And then he now said to them, be fruitful, multiply. Every purpose would bring forth something apart from children. Every marriage would bring forth something apart from children. And when you understand this thing that I'm saying, one day maybe I will teach you a little bit about marriage. But if you understand this thing that I'm saying, part of the conversations you should be having before you marry is you have to be asking yourself, what do you sense we will do for God together? Because if you have that conversation, we did. It's the reason why many people will not understand what's happening between me and Mark. They will not understand it because they can't understand that I'm pastoring here, he's pastoring there. The reason why we can do it is we already knew that each one of us, God was going to use us. And wherever God sends us, the other does not have the permission to stand in the way of the other. Do you understand it? It doesn't change anything in our marriage. But because we had that, we will be spent for purpose. It was easy to get ourselves into that frame of mind. Do you understand it? So every marriage must be purposeful. There is a mandate for every couple, whether it's to bring forth a certain kind of child and raise that child properly, whether it's to take a part of town and become the people who feed it. it there's always something that you find that this couple will just, they will be in sync. And then when they leave church, for instance, if they're in church, you see that this particular family will just be doing a particular thing, no stress. The moment they leave, Nobody else is able to do it. Why? Because that thing was not in those other people's DNA as it was in these people's DNA. Do you understand that? Every marriage is amongst equals. And guys, it's not a marriage seminar, but let me help you. When you first marry her, it will look like you are superior. God will grant two of you long life in Jesus' name. Amen. Just wait the day she wakes up and she's 40 years. I'm giving you signs. 
At 40, the woman says to herself, for starters, you were married, so even the Christian woman, you were married, so if I wait small, I will do better. So you are not better than me. And that's where Kasala begins. You find that at 25, when you married her, anything said, she said, Yes, darling. At 37, she still feels do like that. After I say, mm, It doesn't matter. At 38, self, life still is sweet. At 40, she'll be like, Ah, please, so. And you're like, That's when the husbands begin to ask, Who's your new friend? No, she just, she grew up. You grew up. Do you understand it? A marriage is meant to be amongst equals. Yes, a marriage ought to have, this is number four, order and structure. So for the sake of order and structure, the man is the head of the home, even as Christ is the head of the church. Do you understand it? But when you go to function and you go to responsibility, you find that the man has to lay his life down for his wife. The man should be willing to die for his wife as Christ died for the church. And the woman should be willing to submit do you understand that? So all of it is make room for me and make room for you. And this thing that God called us to works. Every time we enter marriage with the mindset that, oh, one person is better than the other. It's just a matter of time. I promise you before it begins to be, be hard. Do you understand that? So every marriage is amongst equals. If you want scriptures, look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29 to 31. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 7. This one, people will not like it. Marriage at best practice is for a lifetime. Just because fallen man contracts marriage and it falls apart and no, we are not holding, we are not holding it against people that that happened because God wants all of us to come to him. But really when it is done properly from the beginning, it is meant to be for a lifetime. See Matthew chapter 19 verse number 9. Every marriage must have structure and order. The father, God, the father, the husband, the wife, the children. Do you understand that? That's the order. Now tell me because when uh, my they are not my friends actually. When those people who don't, who, when they hear submission, their brain begins to melt. When they hear submission and their brain is melting. But have you read the Bible properly to see that even the man is submitting? It's submit one to another. Do you understand it? Or when you are in a business, or let's say you run a business, isn't there order and structure in your business? Does everybody speak at the meeting at the same time? Is there not someone who says, does everybody sign the checks at the uh, sign the checks is there does everybody sign certain documents there is order so when the things that are temporary and in the world we put order around them why are we so afraid of order in marriage <laughs> like i said it's not a marriage conference so structure and order is part of marriage. See if uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 8 to 9, Colossians 3, 19, Ephesians 5, 21, all the way to 23, 33, you would see that there is an order that God is put in marriage just so that things will be fluid and things will work well. Hallelujah. Every marriage should be empowering. Just like any kind of relationship on earth should be empowering. That means that when I am before my husband, I should feel empowered to be able to dream. When I'm with my husband, I should be able to say, this is what God is saying to me. And he'd listen to me and he would encourage me. I may go out and no one takes a look at the thing that I'm saying or pays second, he, or pays heed to what I'm saying. But when I get home, I should skip to the one I'm married to and say, come and see the dream I'm dreaming again. I should feel empowered enough to be able to share what it is that is going on on the insides of me without feeling like someone would laugh at me and say, you too. Empowering. Marriages should be empowering. And, oh gosh, they won't like this one. Marriage, by biblical standard, is monogamous. Should I break it down? One man, one woman. Not one man, one man. Not one man and a goat. 
Not one woman, one woman. One man, one woman. Do we stick to these things? We don't. That's why it's become big business to do our best to discover the will of God concerning marriage. There is no anybody you go to and they say to you, uh, write the names of all the ones that are around you and bring it. Let us pray. Then they use your head. They can't see nada. They cannot see. If you have Kunle, you have Taufik, and you have a smiler. <laughs> God trusts you to make a dire decision. But make sure that the person, both when you join to that person, both of you will reflect the image of God. Make sure that both of you can find purpose within God and run with it. Make sure that both of you treat each other as equal. Make sure that both of you understand that this is a lifetime commitment. Make sure that both of you understand that structure and submission is not subservience. Make sure that both of you understand that I can empower you and you can empower me. There are, m m husbands should be comfortable enough when they want to make the biggest decision of their lives to sit with their wives it doesn't even matter whether their wife is school sad that's the thing that the the spirit of god had taught me the woman you may be phd and the woman just has school sat peradventure but there is a wisdom that comes in the place of that koinonia or fellowship that you rub off on the wife and the wife rubs off on you. If you listen to each other, you would always make good decisions. Do you get it? So therefore, God says if you are Yoruba, you can marry Ayusa. Nothing is wrong with it. You, if you are Igbo, <laughs> if you are Igbo, you can marry on Yubo. Not a problem. When my younger brother was, by the time my younger brother was three years in Canada, my mother started to pray. And she would come to me. She would be like, eh, are you praying for Thomas? And I'm like, what is the problem? Say, eh, do you think he will ever marry a black person? I said, you don't have enough blackness in your family. You don't want dilution. Let somebody else come and help our destiny. We're too black. See him now. See that. You think they don't want black? When you see Thomas, you go run. I said, Mama, leave that matter. Just let somebody else come. So that our family don't go just continue to be darkness. They go so. Make one white person enter. Mama was like, hey. They said that. I said, Mama, that they kill each other for Lagos. It's not because they are white. It's because they are working for the devil. So our job is just to pray that he would marry someone that is not working for the devil. Is that not all? Parents. Parents, especially if you're beginning, don't big small. I use Jesus to beg you. Pastor Ume and Stashola. It really doesn't matter. In this room, there are more intertribal marriages in this small room than there are same tribe marriages. And when you take a look at it, we're doing just okay. If it's not happening well, it is not because of the tribes. It's because of the persons. Do you understand it? So when we begin to have this conversation about the will of God concerning marriage, I want you to understand that there is no special will of God in the Bible concerning marriage. Oh. So there's nothing like when you turn to the corner and then you do a somersault and you do a flip, the first person you see is the one you marry. He may just be coming from night operation. Just because he wore white clothes does not mean anything. When we set fleeces, that's not how we determine who to marry. I think that marriage is one of the most practical things that we do, that we ought to make sure that all our senses are engaged when we marry. When I wanted to marry, I eventually when God said to me I had to marry, I gave God a list. I know what person way, way, way will stress me. 
I can't be trying to follow you and somebody will stress in my life. There were things, and he said, God actually said to me, I'll omit it. But I didn't, there, there was no tribe there. there. There were a few things that people are holding on to now. But I just wanted someone who loved God enough to let me love God. Do you understand it? And that's why it's working. That's why it's working. But I'm not perfect. And he's not perfect. But two of us fear God. So therefore, I can report him to God. He can report me to God. I know when he's reporting me to God, I can tell. And he can tell, obviously. His own self is worse because I'm the greatest reporter of all time. So in the early hours of our, years of our marriage, I told God many things about Mark. And I always begin, like Adam said, that man that you gave me. But do you know why I could say that? Because I put a man beside his car and my uncle came out of the house and he saw Mark's jalopy parked. And he looked at the car and looked at the car and he kicked it and he said, who parked this jalopy here? And we laughed over it. And when we got this, I said, you choose that man? I said, yes. You chose him? I said, yes. A week to the wedding, he called me again. He said, now you choose Zamo. I said, yes. He said, don't come to my house for rice. So I said, yes, sir. Don't come to my house for water. I said, yes. I said, you chose him. Mo. I said, yes. So we're living. He was living on first Avenue, uh, second Avenue. Yes. Second Avenue. Is it be close? Be close. I was living on 111 Road. C close after I got married. If my house was burning, I dare not go to and tell my husband, Mark. I go and tell my uncle, Mark. I wouldn't do it. Because he warned me and warned me. I said, you sure? I said, yeah, you sure? I said, and he's a soldier. Said, he asked me many times, are you sure this is the person? And I say, yes. You sure? I said, yes. You sure? I said, yes. So he said, if you marry, I'm hold on more. I said, yes, sir. So when we started, and I started to see that it's not as I thought initially, because two of us were coming from diverse ends of the world, and it was not, it, it would take a time for us to blend. In that time when we we're trying to blend, my, uncle was the, my uncle's house was the last place I went. In fact, the moment I left, I didn't even visit them. My husband would visit them from time to time. I thought to myself, I said, if I visit them, I'll tell them what did happen. I shall not be visiting. I stayed in my house. But in that time, we found our way through it. We worked things out, and we have grain, and we're still growing. My brothers and my sisters, the will of God is straightforward when it comes to marriage. Abstain from sexual immorality. So, in marriage, abstain from sexual immorality. Before you marry, abstain from sexual immorality. Everything else, when there's belief, there's commonality, there's value, that you know, you understand this thing, you would make it. And then obviously surround yourself. As with everything that works now. If you have a job, should be even at work. They will hand you to a mentor at work. Isn't it? Why do believers think that they can succeed in their two-couple marriage by themselves? I only tell young people when they come to me and say, Hey, I, if, especially if they are not here. And they say, hey, our marriage, I ask, I say, who do you people submit to? Who is the overseer of your marriage? What older couple do you people look up to? What older couple can you go and sit with and say, this is happening in my marriage? And they know both of you. 80% of the time, they say no one. I say, nobody in your church. Uh, we don't really go to church like that. Uh, not your pastor. Say, ah, especially my pastor. We don't want to be talking to our pastor about those, those things. And I always ask them, say, if you cannot talk to your pastor about your marriage, why are you in that church? Think about it. Because is there no way you should run to? They will save you. And you can't go run there. They, where are you? you are running to me? I can't. I always tell them I can't deal. And the reason is not because I don't want to. But your husband or your wife does not know me enough to give me 
the audience and to listen to what I have to say as well as they know your pastor. So if I will give you any counsel, if you are online, make sure that when you get married, your leaders know you. Do you understand it? Your leaders know you. That final thing I will say, that thing about marriage counseling that you people are running away from, if you want to marry here, start on time. Our marriage counseling, if it's too short, is six months. That's because I have looked at two of you. I know you enough. And I say you can do it in six months. Otherwise, it is one year. I'm telling you the truth because the issues in marriage are too much to be doing a one-month marriage counseling. And no, you don't do marriage counseling with manual. You do marriage counseling by talking about life. <laughs> David, I will make you write a composition. That's how I do marriage counseling. When they come, I say, go and two of you, go to your corner and write a composition. Why I want to marry in Jideka. They'll be like, we should write. Can I just tell you? I say, no, don't tell me. Go home, write it, and email it to me. They used to laugh. They'll be like, ah, I was so hard. I said, because as you're writing, you're thinking. Some people don't finish writing the composition before they realize no road for here but my point is as i close god wants us to be powerful together that's why marriage is being ordained do you understand that but to be powerful together god expects you 80 percent of the decisions that lead to marry god expects you to think it through God expects you to use your brain. That's why he gave you one. That's why he gave you Holy Spirit. To be discerning so that you can make the right decisions. Nobody should choose for you. <laughs> Praise God. What did I say? The day you come to church and Pastor Umi says, Hey, you, that's your husband. I give you permission. Tell him not to ever say that to you again because I won't say it. I know Pastor Mumi will not say it. But our pastors here will not match make you. That's entirely your, your, your joy and your, and your cross. Do it by yourself. Will we clap for you or will we pray for you? May God help you in Jesus' name. So what's the will of God concerning marriage? Who wants to tell me? What's the will of God concerning marriage? Eh? abstain from sexual immorality and make your choice so therefore I'll end this message by saying shine your eyes may God bless you in Jesus name